Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's Beginner's Guide to Foraging Wild Mushrooms. This is our Wednesday focus on growing your own food and growing your own medicine. We're emphasizing food security, um, self-reliance, and basically separating ourselves from the multinational corporations and gaining a little bit more self-reliance in our lifestyles. Um, and so in this vein of talking about food security, I've asked Sarah Delzel Kirkovo, the author of Growing Mushrooms for Beginners, a simple guide to cultivating mushrooms at home. Um, and you've met Sarah before. Sarah is my daughter. And uh, she wrote this book last year while she was uh, expecting her first child. And um, she's gonna talk to us not so much about growing mushrooms this time. Um, she's been with us before talking about growing mushrooms, but today she's gonna be talking about foraging wild mushrooms. Foraging is something that you can do whether you live in an apartment in New York City or you live um, in the wilderness like we do in British Columbia. Foraging is something that everyone has access to. Um, just before I introduce Sarah to you though, I wanted to talk about um, uh, something that happened this week. Um, we get wood delivery from a guy in our small community and uh, he came on Monday morning and uh, as um, he and my husband were unstacking the wood from his truck, onto the ground. Uh, he told us that he had been out foraging for morel mushrooms or moral mushrooms, depending on how you want to pronounce those, that, um, <clears throat> and he had foraged 26 pounds of morels um, in the sh over the weekend, 26 pounds of morels. We've had a lot of rain, a lot, a lot of rain. Um, it's been kind of weird this spring. Uh, first, they told us we were having a drought, then, then the rain started and we have rain, heavy, heavy rains every night. And that is what brings forward those warm days with the, with the rain at night is what brings forth the mushrooms. So if you live where I live in British Columbia or anywhere, uh, Western Washington, this is ideal mushroom foraging time. So I asked Sarah to come and talk to us about foraging mushrooms. And if you're a beginner forager of mushrooms, you don't have to be nervous because there are actually a few look-alike mushrooms that um, are easy for beginners to identify. They're not dangerous. They don't have any poisonous look-alikes. And those are the ones Sarah's gonna talk to us about today. And then she's gonna also give us some tips about foraging. Now, let me tell you a bit about Sarah. So Sarah is passionate about, actually, let me, let me, um, let me pin you, Sarah, while I talk about you so everybody can see you. Let's see, uh, replace All right. That. There we go. So Sarah is passionate about gardening and finding creative ways to produce food in small spaces. She enjoys empowering others to grow and cook their own food, skills that she believes build confidence. Sarah is the founder of wearingwood.com and is it ninjagardening.com? Did I get that right? Yeah. Ninjagardening.com. Yep. And she also is a writer at joybeliefarm.com. So Sarah, I'm gonna pass it over to you. And if you could uh, share your insight about foraging mushrooms, you actually have more experience than I do foraging mushrooms. So you truly are an expert. Thanks, Chris. So there's always a lot of nervousness for a lot of people around foraging for wild mushrooms. And it's very well founded. A lot of mushrooms are highly toxic, highly poisonous and highly dangerous. And even some of the more friendly varieties, if you eat too much of them, they can cause stomach aches or if you eat them raw. So we're gonna focus on the safe way to forage for wild mushrooms. So there's a couple things to keep in mind to stay safe. You wanna positively ID mushrooms from at least three sources. This can be two different field guides and a mushroom identification group. This can be a field guide and spore printing and a knowledgeable friend who's harvested mushrooms in your area. You just wanna make sure you've done three checks for whatever variety of mushrooms you're wanting to forage. 
you need to be 100% positive that your idea is correct. Most of the varieties I'm covering do not have gills and have very few harmful lookalikes. Mushrooms with gills are more challenging to positively ID, so you want to be even more careful if you're, say, foraging for meadow mushrooms or something like that. Along with positively IDing, just don't eat a mushroom you're not sure of. If it's your first time IDing the mushroom, you probably don't want to eat at that time. You want to ID it more than once. Avoid the white and pink gilled metal mushrooms because while they could be button mushrooms, they could also be the highly poisonous amitas. Obviously in nature, bright colors mean toxicity. So avoid any bright orange or red mushrooms or blue. There are blue mushrooms too. While some poisonous mushrooms will grow in groups, most poisonous mushrooms grow singly or with just one or two nearby. So that also gives you an idea of where you're gonna not want to harvest a mushroom. A single bright orange mushroom is obviously gonna to be toxic. A large cluster of bullets is gonna be a lot more obvious that they're safe. So let's talk about the bullet family first. There are multiple varieties of bullets that are safe for foraging. And they share the same characteristics of a spongy cap, a stem that widens toward the base. They have no, um, what's the word? Gill umbrella. And they also don't have gills, they have pores. So the pores appear like a sponge. If you break a bullet in half, it'll have the fleshy part up here and then the spore base looks sort of like a sponge with um, narrow tubes and it'll have the same like distance as the gill mushrooms have but it won't be won't be the delineated gills the stalk is wider at the base narrower toward the cap often particularly if it's recently after a rain the bullet family will have a slimy cap Even if you get a bullet just as it's breaking out of the ground, it's so attractive to mushroom worms and flies that they're probably already trying to eat it. Many of the bullet species will bruise blue, so if you break it open and pinch the skin, take your finger away and look at it, it'll turn blue. The um, one toxic variety bullet does the same thing, but it has a different color cap and flesh than the non-toxic ones that do it, which are usually yellow and bruise blue. Edible bullets grow under conifers and some poplar species. This is an example of an edible bullet. You'll notice that the sponge base here is yellow. And you can see how it has sort of a pore marking versus the gill delineation that you're used to with meadow mushroom, or sorry, agaricus species mushrooms, the portobello and the button mushroom. The one dangerous bullet is the Bulletus ruboflamius and it has a deep purple to reddish cap and dark red pores in the spongy part. The stem is, has coarse dark red raised areas, lightening to yellow close to the cap, so it has more texture on the stem than the, other, than the edible bullet species. And all parts of this mushroom stain blue and damage. So if you're looking for bullets, avoid a, the dark red one that bruises blue. Morels are one of our most well-known exotic wild mushrooms in North America. There are many edible morels. And I just want to highlight the appearance of the one in the image here, how it does not look like a brain. It looks more like a honeycomb. So remember that morels, you want something that looks like a honeycomb. Morels love aspens, birch, poplar, and can sometimes be found in abandoned orchards. So make sure you're looking under the right trees. All edible morals share the honeycomb look. They also share the hat shape. I call it a gnome hat shape. And morals do not have gills. So any moral that you cut open is gonna actually have a hollow cap and hollow stem. Morals emerge in spring and once you spot one, you'll be able to spot the others. They always grow in large groups usually under the entire forested area you're looking in. Many morals have dark outlines on the upper, on the edges of the honeycomb with lighter toward the base of the honeycomb pattern. So you'll also be able to identify that um, color delineation. It also helps them blend in. 
There's a couple looks alike as a moral species. The false moral or dog moral is commonly dark brown with a larger distorted shape, not the nice neat hat, and a brain-like pattern instead of the honeycombs. Uh, false moral is found under deciduous trees. Dog moral is usually found under conifers, like spruce. Elf and saddle mushrooms have a two peak cap. So they have a peak on this side and peak on this side with the hollow in the center and the stem in the middle. Again, they also look more like a brain and are usually a solid dark brown. Uh, dog moral and false moral will also be more of a solid dark brown than the um, variegated colors that are often found in regular morals. This here is an example of a false moral. And you can see that it has a brain uh, texturization and it's not a nice neat cone shape. You can add wild morals to your local ground if you have an acreage with any of the trees that they like growing on it. You just need to find your wild morals and harvest them. Blend up the morals with water in a blender instead of eating them for dinner. Then pour onto aspen alder or apple wood chips in a forested or shaded area with similar trees. If you don't have like aspen or apple on your own property, you can just bring in the wood chips. It won't be quite as successful as if you have the trees because the morals do form a symbiotic relationship with the roots of the trees that they are found under. So if you have some young apple trees or something, you can bring in wood chips of um, aspen or alder or just branches from the area you found the mushrooms in, chip up those branches, put them down under your trees, add your moral slurry to them. And in a couple of years, you should have mushrooms coming up on your own property that are morale mushrooms. And once you start harvesting them, they will fruit every spring for you. Our next friendly non-gilled and easily identifiable mushroom is the common puffball. Now I found a couple puffballs just a few days ago out walking on our local rail trail. And while they were a little bit old so I couldn't eat them, it was good to spot them and know that they were growing in the area. There are multiple varieties of puffball mushroom, but all will share the same characteristic of being perfectly round and sealed. They have no gills or sponges and only very rarely do they have a short stem. Puffballs love open, compact ground where animals have been. I found them on the side of the rail trail where we often have people walking their, uh, riding their horses and stuff. So they can even be found in the city and on the edges of trails. Most puffballs should be harvested when they're about this size, about an inch or so in diameter. Um, some puffballs, like the giant puffball, can get up to head size and still be good to harvest, as in your head size. And puffballs will nearly always grow in groups. Giant puffball falls, you'll usually find fewer than our usual smaller North American ones, where you can find 20 or 30 in a very small area. Puffballs do not have any lookalikes that actually remain spherical and continue to have an absence of gills. The poisonous amita, when a button can vaguely resemble a puffball, but if you pick it and cut it open, it will be very obvious that it has pink gills and you don't want to keep that mushroom. If you want to double check your verification when you're out harvesting, you would pick the mushroom and cut it in half and just double check that the mushroom you're looking at and the group of mushrooms you're looking at is solid white flesh all the way through with no gill delineations. The amnita can usually grow singly. Sometimes you can have two or three coming off the same spot, but by and large, it's usually a very small single or double cluster, that's it. One of my favorite gilled mushrooms is the oyster mushroom. And depending on your area and climate, you will have a different type of oyster mushroom than I will. My local area will have white or blue oyster mushrooms in pre preference. If you live down somewhere like Florida or Texas, you're probably gonna have pink oyster mushrooms growing wild. And if you live somewhere in between, you might have the yellow ones as well as the gray or as well as the white. So you can have a wide variety of oyster mushrooms growing. Oyster mushrooms will always grow out of logs or stumps in overlapping hands, usually on deciduous trees. You don't really have a lot of oysters that like conifers. 
Um, pink oyster mushroom specifically loves water oaks in Florida. So if you live in that area, you might find a lot. The gills of the oyster mushroom go from the edge of the cap all the way down the stem, giving it the distinctive trumpet shape. And they can be off-white, white, white, blue, gray, pink, or yellow. You get quite a rainbow with these guys. And the stems on the oyster mushroom are most often offset on just one side of the cap. And the stem and cap run together. They're not strictly delineated. You can see in this image from the forest that how the oyster mushrooms just flow into their stems. And you can't really delineate where the stem and the cap are. So as I was saying about the different temperatures, uh, different types of oysters will fruit at different temperatures. Usually the white will fruit when the area is around 60 to 70 Fahrenheit. Uh, blue, gray, 70 to 80. Same with yellow. The pink fruits usually around 80 to 90 Fahrenheit in Florida. What you wanna do is check your local region, maybe get as part of a mushroom group in your local region, and that'll help you figure out what temperatures and what time of year the oyster mushrooms are going to start fruiting for you. There are a couple lookalikes you want to keep an eye out for with oyster mushrooms. The jack-o'-lantern mushroom is bright orange and has a similar growing characteristic and similar gill structure, but again it's bright orange. The ivory funnel is a white mushroom where the gills stop at the stem and the stem is centered it has a ground growth habit as well, but it has some similar um, cap shaping to some of the oyster mushrooms. So you'll wanna watch out for that one. And the ghost fungus, which is found only in India, Japan, and Australia, um, grows exactly similarly to the oyster mushrooms, except it glows in the dark. Thankfully, we shouldn't have it in North America, but if you're wanting to double check, stick your mushrooms in a dark box and look at them through a peephole. You can add oyster mushrooms to your garden by either harvesting local wild oyster mushrooms or getting ones from the grocery store. You can add, if you're using wood chips as a base for a hugelkultura bed, you can just add mushrooms as if you were adding them to a compost pile to the wood chips and eventually they will micellate through the hugelkultura bed and start fruiting out of the sides of your bed. Oyster mushrooms are aggressive, so you can also catch spore from them or do a tissue culture and start growing mycelium on coffee grounds and paper and gradually use that to create mushroom lock, blocks, logs, grow bags, or and use that mycelium that you cre you're growing, sorry, use the mycelium that you're growing to inoculate stumps, fallen logs, or wood chip beds on your own property. And if you start growing mushroom logs with oyster mushrooms, you can also, after three or four years when the logs are calming down and no longer fruiting as well, you can use those as a base for a hugel called tour bed and have the mushrooms continue growing in your garden. Moving on to one of the wild medicinal mushrooms that grows in North America, we have the turkey tail. I'd like to highlight from the image, you have both old turkey tail from the previous year in the background and fresh young turkey tail from this year. It characteristics of the turkey tail, it's a shell fungus, and it has fine pores on the underside of the mushroom fruiting body. The pores are approximately three per millimeter. So if you were to stick the tip of a ballpoint pen against the underside of the mushroom, you would have more than one pore on the tip of that pen. The underside of the fruiting body is whitish, sort of a cream color, and it has a velvety soft feel to the top of the mushroom. It also has a very strong uh, brown color delineation zones, so darker brown near where it's older, going to lighter brown, going to white where it's still growing, as it grows, that white area will gradually shrink until it disappears when it stops growing at the end of the growing season. It should be a thin and flexible mushroom, even when it's 
dry, not actively growing. The old ones will still be thin and flexible even after the full winter. And the turkey tail growing season lasts up to eight months. Unlike morels, which are only a spring mushroom or oyster mushrooms that only fruit in certain temperatures, turkey tail, once they start growing, they'll grow through the whole season. And you can find turkey tail on hardwood or conifer trees. So no matter what forest area you have around you, you can go looking for turkey tails in it. The false turkey tail is the first of the lookalikes. It has no pores and a brown underside versus the fine pores and the cream colored or white colored underside. The violet toothed polypore has similar colorations, but its underside has a coarse toothed characteristic to it and a violet tone. So not the fine pores and cream tone that you're looking for. So the turkey tail is a medicinal mushroom. You can preserve it by drying. You can probably also bring some of those mushrooms to your property and encourage it to grow on your own trees. It will probably grow for you. So you can also bring that one home. One of my personal favorites for mushrooms for fresh eating and medicinal use is the lion's mane mushroom. It is another wild mushroom with a very, very distinct appearance. So lion's mane characteristics, it is a tooth fungus that grows on hardwood trees, maple, oak, and is one of the few mushrooms that will grow on a black walnut. What it means by it being toothed is that in the growing appearance, the mushroom actually grows long, thin strands that look either like icicles or two teeth or just fuzz, but they grow and hang down. So it has a very, very distinct appearance. The large, the mushroom grows as a large fruiting body can be anywhere from like the size of your hand to the size of your head. It has a very strong, good mushroom smell with the slightly seed food tone I found when I was growing it. And it can be found growing on trees. It often will grow in like a decayed hollow in a tree. So if you're going by a large hardwood tree that you notice has a hollow in it, it might be worth glancing in to see if it has a mushroom. Lion's mane has no poisonous lookalikes. There is a ground growing mushroom that looks similar called a coral mushroom, but it is also edible. And the lion's mane mushroom grows on trees, even when it grows near the ground, it's still on the tree itself. I'm just gonna go back one slide. One of the unique things about lion's mane mushrooms is that if you go out to harvest it, whether from your own logs that you're growing or in the wild, if you leave some of the flesh on the tree where you harvest it, the mushroom will automatically regrow a mushroom on that spot. So then you can come back in a week or two and most likely get another mushroom from the first one you found. Any mushroom can be moved and grown on your property. All mushrooms have spores and most varieties can be prop propagated by a tissue culture. So you can either catch spore and then use that spore to inoculate a growing medium, or you can take tissue from the mushroom and put it in your growing med medium and it will start growing itself. One way to catch spore is over a Petri dish. Then you can add the um, agar syrup to it and that will encourage the spore to start growing. And then you can use that to inject into your sawdust or your coffee grounds if you're used doing oyster mushrooms and you can start to grow your own mushroom spawn. Oyster mushrooms specifically are very aggressive and can just be tissue cultured into sawdust or grain spawn and they will grow for you. You can also grow store mushrooms like button mushrooms, portobello mushrooms, um, king oyster mushrooms, any of the mushrooms you find in the grocery store, whether they're from the Asian section or the regular section or the gourmet section, you can culture and grow. You just have to mark where you planted them and what they look like. So you know that when they come up, that is the mushroom you planted and you're not worried about misidentifying. And if you're collecting mushrooms in the wild, 
you always want to preserve what you can't eat fresh. And mushrooms, you can preserve by dehydrating. You can saute and freeze. You can just freeze or you can dehydrate and powder them. Most mushrooms will do better with either dehydrating or sauteing and freezing. Just freezing, most mushrooms will make will break the cell structure and make them watery. And then mushrooms like lion's mane, turkey tail, any of the medicinal mushrooms, you may want to dehydrate and powder them and use the powder for medicinal purposes. Do we have any questions today? Chris, would you like to come back in? Sure. Do you want to stop your screen share? Uh, did you want me to go to the, la the last slide about the book or just pause, stop the oh, share? Um, we already talked about it. Why, why don't you talk about your book and then we'll come back for questions. Okay, so think of questions. And Growing Mushrooms for Beginners covers um, six different varieties of much mushrooms, the agaricus species, shiitake, oyster mushrooms, reishi, cordyceps, lion and lion's mane. Mushrooms on how to grow them at home, even if all you have is a little bit of space on your kitchen counter. And if you want more information about um, expanding mushroom spawn or um, growing out mushrooms and increasing the number of blocks you're trying to fruit or anything like that. There is information in the book that will help you with doing that. There's also information about preser preserving your mushrooms, cooking with your mushrooms. Oh yeah, that was the variety I, I forgot about. I also talk about growing wine cap mushrooms, which are one of the larger garden varieties of mushrooms that you can grow, say with your tomato plants, and then go out and have tomatoes and basil and mushrooms for dinner, just harvesting in one area of your garden. All right. Um, so I see that Tracy's here. Thanks for coming, Tracy. And CJ is here. Um, if you have any questions, uh, Sarah is here to answer questions. And as I said, Sarah is the real expert here on growing mushrooms and foraging for mushrooms. So I know Tracy is also an expert. Tracy uh, teaches mushroom foraging as a naturalist. And uh, so she might even have some things to add to the group. And uh, Robin has shared the book link in the uh, Facebook group as well, Sarah. So if people wanna pick up your book, and again, I'll just hold up my copy I actually bought this on Amazon so I could leave a um, review. Um, <clears throat> and I have to say, Canada got the books almost a month later than the US Amazon. So I had to wait a long time to get this book. All right. Did One of the things I'm doing at the moment as a personal project, just if people want ideas, is I got a handful of sawdust spawn and I just have it on my counter. It's for oyster mushrooms. And I've just been adding my daily coffee grounds to it. And it is actually growing mycelium and the mushrooms are consuming the coffee grounds. And when I have some more time to work on it, I'm gonna split that into two boxes with more material and I plan to fruit out those boxes while still growing and increasing the um, mycelium on my counter with just my daily addition of coffee grounds. I see we have a question. Uh, the question is, how do you know when to go looking for mushrooms? Is it a general time or specific to the mushroom? So generally, in the spring is the best time to start looking for mushrooms. Depending on your area, it will vary for the species of mushrooms. Uh, we're the mountains of British Columbia. So morels are starting to fruit in about end of May through to middle of July. Turkey tails will fruit for the entire year. Basically, as long as it's above zero, they will be growing and trying to fruit. Puffballs are usually a spring mushroom. Sometimes you'll get them with the autumn rains. 
if you're growing mushroom logs for yourself and not trying to force fruiting during the winter or the summer, they'll usually fruit with the spring rains and with the autumn rains. And uh, certain bolets fruit in the spring, certain other ones fruit in the fall. It depends a lot on the variety, but usually you can guarantee that damp, rainy weather with a little bit of sun, you're gonna have some type of mushroom starting to fruit. Sarah, how, long, how often should a person go out looking? I know, um, for instance, there is a, a mushroom in my garden that I looked on Sunday and it was this big. And then I looked yesterday and it was this big. Now it's not an edible mushroom, um, but it, it grew that much in one day, 24 hours. Um, so how often should someone go out looking for mushrooms to make sure they get them in their prime? If you're looking for something like most wild mushrooms, morel mushrooms, you want to check every morning once you know it's about the right conditions for them to fruit. That way you get the ones that come up overnight and even the ones that came up later in the day yesterday, you'll still get them usually before the worst of the bugs find them. So, so basically it's a race against the bugs is what you're saying. Basically, and again, before the mushroom gets too old or starts drying out because the afternoon sun hit it and it wasn't quite as shaded in that specific spot and stuff like that. Mushrooms like the lion's mane, they grow really s relatively slow, but also relatively large. So if you see a really small lion's mane, yeah, you could harvest it or you could wait a few days and you'll probably get a larger one. You just want to monitor if you know where it is and it's close enough to home. Is if you're there, just going out once a week to harvest mushrooms somewhere in the forest or just go mushroom hunting, harvest whatever you find. But at the same time, don't harvest a crappy mushroom. If it's spongy, worm eaten, whatever, just leave it in the forest. So life is too short to waste it on harvesting subpar mushrooms. Um, I did want to add too, um, when you, most of the time when we're harvesting herbs in the wild, we only want to take a third of what we see and we want to leave the rest. That's not the case with mushrooms so much because mushrooms um, are just the fruiting body. The actual mushroom itself is the mycelium that's already through the area. So if you take a mushroom, you're not um, taking what, um, you're not taking all of it it will still come back because the actual roots of the mushroom are throughout whatever uh, substrate you're, you're harvesting from. So if you see three uh, bullet mushrooms, you can go ahead and take all three. There, um, but what we recommend is that when you're harvesting, you use a basket so that any spores that are coming out of that mushroom as you're walking to your car um, will spread in the forest. Would you concur with that, Sarah? Harvesting mushrooms is the one time where a mesh bag is useful. Also, um, some mushroom varieties like the morel, they don't release as much spores as other varieties, which is why if you want to propagate them on your own property, you would want to blend them up and dump them on the ground. So if, say with morels, you want to spread morels when you're harvesting, you can harvest all the morels in an area, but keep the older, crappier ones to the side and then toss them into new areas as you're walking back to your vehicle. Because that will also serve to spread the mushrooms within the forest. And also if you're trying to grow mushrooms at home, just a polite reminder that mushrooms are a fungus, which means that mushroom mycelium looks like mold. But it does not smell like mold and it does not affect mold allergies. So I wanted to add a little bit to uh, what you said about the oyster mushrooms. Um, if you can get oyster mushroom mycelium or sawdust spawn or even oyster mushrooms in the store, you can get free coffee grounds from your local coffee bistro um, and just start them on that. You don't have to do the small coffee grounds like Sarah's talking about. Um, oyster mushrooms will also fruit on old blue jeans as long as they're 100% cotton. Um, I have done them on that. 
Um, they'll also, um, let me just pin this. There we go. Um, so they'll also fruit on um, coffee grounds, tea, um, rancid oatmeal. So whatever you have at home, you can probably fruit uh, oyster mushrooms if you're interested um, in doing such a thing. I have, I have them right now in my garden on just some straw mulch. And oh, wow, Sarah, is this your coffee ground project that you're doing? Yep, but I just want to try and show you what the mycelium looks like. Uh, this side looks good. Right at the edge here, you can see how white it looks. That's the mushroom mycelium that's growing. Excellent. And usually when your substrate is completely well isolated like that, that's about the time that your home mushrooms would be ready to start fruiting. So I'm actually gonna be dividing this little box of mycelium up into two larger containers so that I end up with a fairly solid block to fruit out. So I should get probably, once I lay it out, I should probably get about five to seven pounds of mushrooms off of the two blocks I'll be able to make out of this. So, so this is the mushroom, the oyster mushrooms you got from me in, in a little baggie about two weeks ago, right? Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Yep, just less than a cup of sawdust spawn to start this out. And then just coffee grounds. That's all I've added to this is just coffee grounds and mixed it up a few times. Excellent, excellent. So I hope you found that, that this inspiring and that you're inspired to uh, grow some mushrooms, uh, pick up Sarah's book if that's of interest to you. Um, and you don't have to have a garden to grow these mushrooms. Sarah's doing it on her kitchen counter. Um, or go out foraging and put on your boots, get some exercise, get out in the sunshine and look for some morels, some oyster mushrooms, some turkey tail and enjoy yourself out in nature. Um, and we'll be back next week with a special, um, a special event because next week is International Pollinator Week. And we're gonna start on Monday. We're gonna have some special events inside this Facebook group um, every single day next week um, with some games, some fun, some information about wild pollinators, honeybees, um, and uh, improving your garden to attract more pollinators. And that's going to start on Monday next week for International Pollinator Week. So we hope that you'll join us for that as well. And thanks for joining me for this talk. Thank you, Sarah, for coming and sharing your um, information, your knowledge, and your expertise on growing mushrooms, foraging mushrooms. And uh, we'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining me.